במים זכים הוא רוחץ את רגלי, אדוני אלוהי ריבוני. ברוח קודשו ממלא את רוחי אדוני אלוהי הוסי דמו היקר הוא שפך על נפשי מצלבו הבודד והנורא מים חיים הוא נותן לי לשתות אדוני אל חי ישוע It's a worship song in Hebrew that I grew up with. Uh, the words remind us that Yeshua shed his blood and he washes us clean with clean water and also our sins with his blood. Welcome to our synagogue. As far as I know, this is the only full-size replica of a first century synagogue of its kind in the whole world. We have seven columns. The number seven in the Bible is the number for wholeness or completeness. The corner storage room over here is where we believe they kept jars like these, where they kept their scrolls stored to protect them. All the materials of the buildings that you have seen, as I told you at the start of our tour, or actually Rima told you, right, are only natural materials, just what they had available to them 2,000 years ago, right? We have stone, wood, and earth. This is not concrete. This is mud, earth and water, yes, mixed with lime, kalk, and ashes from fires. The plaster on the walls and what you're sitting on, the layers above the reeds in the roof, everything is only natural materials mixed together in different proportions and therefore really hard work to keep them together. High maintenance. Synagoge is a word in Greek. Beit Knesset in Hebrew means almost the same thing. A house to gather in. And so as the name implies, we believe that they function maybe more like community centers do today. Some people say that the children came to read from the scrolls, how to read. So maybe it was like a school, maybe a courthouse, almost certainly to gather together, uh, maybe have discussions, almost certainly to celebrate the biblical holidays, the feasts, but of course Shabbat. Saturday is the most important day. Uh, the community comes together to hear the word of God read in public and to hear teaching about the Bible. And so in Luke 4, we have Jesus coming back to Nazareth where he grew up to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which was his custom. He stands up to read. He's given the scroll of Isaiah. He opens it up and he finds the place where it says verse 18 and on. Yeah. 18. I think I will read uh, all the time. No, no, 18 and on, just, please. Just 18 and on. Herrens ånd er over mig, for han har salvet mig til å forkynne evangeliet for fattige. Han har sendt mig for å forkynne for fanger at de skal få frihet, og for blinde at de skal få syn, for å sette undertrykte fri, for å forkynne et nådens år fra Herren. Han lukket boken og gav den til tjeneren og satte seg. Alle som var i synagogen hadde sine øyne festet på ham. Han begynte så med å si til dem, I dag er dette skriftens ord blitt oppfylt for ørene deres. Så, deres første reaksjon til denne nyheten, i dag er det fullført, er veldig positivt. They're saying, wow, these are good words, gracious words coming out from his mouth. But do you remember what happens a few minutes later? They want to throw him off a cliff. <laughs> Kill him.
him. What? What changed their minds? Two stories he tells them at the end, and then they get very angry at him. What are these stories, right? A widow, God saves her from starving, right? You know what I'm talking about? And Naaman, right? He has a terrible skin disease, leprosy, and God heals him. So what's the problem with these stories? They're nice. God is doing miracles. Something about these two people bothers the people. What's that? They're not Jewish. Oh. Luke 4, Jewish town. Sabbath day, synagogue. Which means everybody, including Jesus, pretty much is Jewish. And Jesus says, oh, I have good news, everybody. I've come to save you, my people, the Jewish people. But I've also come to save people like Naaman. Naaman, you remember who he was? Not only was he not Jewish, he's the general of the enemy army. Hold on, Jesus. Are you saying you're planning to save and heal our enemies? No. If you're the Messiah, you're supposed to get rid of the Romans. Not to save them. What Jesus is teaching goes totally against all their hopes. And everything that they were expecting that the Messiah will do when he comes. This is why they reject what he's teaching. No, no, no. It must be some kind of false teaching. He must be a false Messiah. So they think they are doing the will of God when they take him out to kill him. But Luke tells us Jesus just passes through the crowd and he leaves Nazareth. In case uh, we're tempted to say that these Nazarene people are pretty foolish, I want to point something out. I don't know what's going on in Norway right now, but here not a lot has changed. God, can we please have some honest politicians? We need better government and better laws. You know, a little bit of money won't hurt us at all. We need better finances, a healthier economy. This is the solution to our problems, right? Does this sound familiar at all? When Jesus comes, notice he doesn't change the financial or the political situation. Instead, he tells us, Are you tired yet of your own solutions? Have you become weary and heavy laden? So, come to me. I will give you rest. Hmm. I think this is a slightly different solution than the political and the financial messiahs that we tend to look for these days. Wouldn't you agree? The symbol and logo of Nazareth Village is the simple little kind of oil lamp. We've chosen this as our symbol Because Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And we found many like these in archaeological digs. We'd like to give you a little gift of an oil lamp. We hope that you get this home. You remember you came here. Maybe you'll pray for us. Maybe you will help us out in other ways. If God is leading you to do that, we appreciate that. As I said, we're a not-for-profit. But most importantly, we hope you take this and you take it and you shine the light of Jesus with you wherever you go. Thank you for coming and God bless you. Okay, a group is waiting to get inside. Please, let's come out as quickly as we can and take a left.